Hello, everyone, and welcome. We're glad you're here. Tonight's training is brought to you by Chris Goff and Bo Manry, the founders of the REI Pro Software. My name is Bo Manry, and Chris and I, we have this mission to help educate you guys and provide you with the very best tools that you can be successful as a real estate investor. And now tonight, we're taking a deep dive into seller financing. If you aren't doing seller finance deals, then you really need to pay attention as this is one of the most profitable strategies to have in your toolbox. So welcome, Chris Goff. You're right. This is a deep subject. Yeah, but it's and one that I'm excited about. So that's why I'm like ready to go, you know? I just see so many people that are just so confused all this. That's like, you know, that's like sub two or wrap, what's seller financing. And then I'll, I'll throw out a video called subordination and people are like, what the heck is going on? So <laughs> I'm going to clear all that up tonight. Good. It's 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 going to be extremely educational, so definitely take notes. All right, just welcome everyone, and uh, we're super glad that you've joined us. This strategy here is one that's going to build passive income. It's also going to set you up for retirement in a very short period of time, and it doesn't matter if you're 23 years old or 60. This can all be done in just a few years. Now, everything I'm going to teach tonight can all be done in REI Pro, which I'm going to walk through at the end from finding actual deals right now to marketing them, running the numbers, deciding your exit strategy. It's just the most complete system that's going to walk you through the entire buying selling process. And this is exactly what we're known for. Now, before I dive into seller financing, to me, this is so important, so important. And I call it the three financing techniques. A good real estate bargain is defined as buying a piece of real estate in such a way that whatever your intent with the property, flip or hold, and of course, other strategies, you are guaranteed to make money. Obviously, we don't want to buy a property and not make money. I define this in three different ways. The first way is paying cash. And, and I'm not saying take dollar bills out of your pocket. What I'm saying is pay the seller in one lump sum. If we do that, generally, we'd like to get a discount. Number two is what we call terms. And then number three is getting a discount on the price, but setting the terms of that agreement, which we're going to get into during this presentation. So just, just hold tight here because this is all going to make sense. I promise you. I spent a lot of time working how this presentation should be presented. The one thing I want you to look at is what we call terms. And what does that mean? It's simple. How much down, how much a month, and how long can I do it for? I want you to think about this, how common terms is. Forget about seller financing for a second. Almost every major purchase, not even, does it even have to be a major purchase? How many people have an iPhone or an Android that, hey, I'm going to make payments on this for the next two years, and then I'll trade it in. And then I'll make payments on it for the next two years. What about a home? How many people actually go and pay cash? Slim to none because most people don't have all the cash. And the people that have all that cash usually don't put it back into something like this without getting a return on that income. What about car purchases? Jet skis, boats, campers, you name it. We buy things on terms. That is the American way. How much down? How much a month? And how long can we do it for? Right. So, so if I go look at this Corvette, right? So I price this Corvette out 110,000. So the salesperson comes up to me, he's like, Hey, Chris, price on this is 110,000. I'm like, Oh, you know, I, I don't want to spend 110,000 on the, this car here, right? He goes back to the manager, he comes back, he says, Hey, Chris, I got great news. You can get into this car with zero down today. $18.75 a month. And just imagine how good you're going to look on this driving Sunday afternoons. <laughs> and I'm like, hey, I could do that. Right? All right, side me up. You know, I'm thinking about the Sunday drives and, you know, what he failed to tell me with the interest, I'm going to end up paying $135,000 for a $110,000 car. Now, do we all know this in the back of our mind? Absolutely. But why do we do it? Because we don't have the cash to just dump into things that we buy. You know, most of America, they live paycheck to paycheck. You can't afford to even save up enough cash to go do those things. And it makes it very difficult to pay cash. 
So terms, how much down, how much a month, how long we, can we do this for? Really so common in everyone's livelihoods today. Think about a house, a 30-year mortgage. If you bought a $350,000 home today, 7% interest, 30 years. Not that most people stay in a home 30 years, but if you did, you would end up paying in principal payments, almost what you paid for it, 488,000 in interest, a total of 838. What's that almost three times the amount that you actually bought it for? And why do we do this? Because we don't have the 350 grand. Think about this. The first 12 months on this property, look how much interest we pay. Look at that. So the total payment is 2328. What goes to principal, which is going to knock down the balance is only what, $287, but 2000 of that, just the first payment straight interest. Five years at this rate, your balance would be 329. You would have made $20,000 worth of principal payments, meaning that's what's going to come off. But you paid 119000 just in interest. Why do you think the banks have the biggest buildings? It's because of interest. How much down, how much a month, how long can we do it for? That's what we call seller financing. So the business of creating financing to purchase properties, this is going to allow you to sell acting as the bank, receiving monthly payments without the use of any lending institution involved in the transaction. So not only can I acquire property via seller finance, I can sell property via seller finance only if I have the deed. A lot of people say, Chris, I just did a lease option on the house. Can I sell or finance it? No, you don't have the deed. The deed is what rules. When you talk lease options, that's more what I call controlling real estate or seller financing is owning real estate. Just as much as all those people that own your own home today, you get financing from a bank or just getting the seller to finance that, which is on paper. This is going to work no matter what type of investor you are. I don't care if you're just getting started, you've been in the business a long time. I don't care if you work residential or commercial. You're going to find this is more common in commercial. You're also going to find this is more common in vacant land. If you're a wholesaler, this strategy is going to work and I'm going to teach you how to do it if you are a wholesaler. If you're a rehabber, this is a no-brainer. Think about what a rehabber does. They either pay cash or they go and get financing, hard money, private money, or a bank. Seller financing, we're going to dictate the terms with the owner. So that means you don't have to necessarily put down 20%. You're not begging for a loan. And it doesn't go on your credit report. So as a rehabber, I could technically seller finance a home for six months. Just get the owner. Hey, if the house has been vacant five years, what six more months? fix up the home, put it back on the market and resell it, cash the seller out, I'm good. That's a no brainer for a rehabber. If you work lease options, which is one of my favorite strategies, this one's just gonna make you more money. If you're working the pre-foreclosure business, this is what you're doing. 99% of the time, it's a seller financing strategy. If you're a landlord, this is really the perfect solution at some point, you can only get so much financing. Then you have to look for private money. But if I can get the seller to do creative financing, meaning seller financing, I could then buy as many properties that I can get my hands on. So I don't really care what type of investor you are. This is going to work. Some of the benefits for an investor, little to no money down, low fixed interest rate. Remember, we are deciding the terms with the seller. Now, of course, it has to be agreeable right? They're not just always going to say zero down, 1% interest, but we get to dictate that to make sure it's financially going to work for us. No bank qualification. We're not going to a bank begging for a loan. No credit check. Could a seller ask you for a credit check? Sure. I could tell you in 20 years, not one seller has asked me for a credit check. Lower closing costs. We have a lot less paperwork. We don't have the bank financing piece to it. It's going to be a lot cheaper. It's not going to show up on your credit report, like I said, so you could buy as many as you get your hands on. Easy to sell to another buyer. Why? Because we already live on terms. What's the difference if they go to a bank or if they come to me and do the same thing? Now, I could probably charge a little bit more, 
but I may not have the strict qualifications that a bank would require. I can tell you, this is my home. And I wanted to just share this with you because this is something we do. So this is my front and that's my backyard right there. This home was vacant 10 years, owned free and clear, needed some repairs, needed updates. Every piece of furniture in this home was included in the sale. ARV 1.4 million. Here's what we did. 1 million on the purchase price, 45,000 down. The seller asked me how much I could put down. I said 45. He said, okay, that sounds fair. You won't know unless you ask. Four and a half percent interest. I offered 4%. He came back at five and he's like, you know, Chris, let's just go right in the middle. Four and a half percent. We always amortize these loans generally over 30 years in order to keep the monthly payment low. I'm going to show you how to do this part, okay? And we did it, what's called a six-year balloon, meaning after six years of paying, whatever my balance owed after six years, I need to cash him out, which would either be, well, think about it. I could refinance it if I want to stay here. I could sell the property because I have the deed. I own it. I could refinance it and sell or finance it back out. I could refinance it and rent it out. I could refinance it and use it as an Airbnb. I have options. I have so many options when you have the deed. And on top of that, he said, Chris, you know what? I really like you. Your family is wonderful. Don't worry about paying me for six months. Y'all get moved in. That's the last thing I want you to worry about. And I'm telling you right now, when you learn how to do this business, when you learn how to follow the steps that we're teaching you, how to communicate with people, how to build relationships, credit check never came up. We closed this property in less than 15 minutes at the title company. This is a home run strategy. I mean, think about it. This is my home. This isn't just something, hey, I'm investing in. And I'll also think about this. If I refinance this property, I could potentially pull a lot of tax-free cash back out of here. What, what am I going to do with that? Well, there's only one purpose of money. It's to make more money. If you're that person out there, you've watched YouTube video after YouTube video, and you're still confused. Being an investor and doing it this business since 1999, I know that we have crafted over 30 types of seller financing. There's a lot of different ways to structure the deal, but it really comes down to two ways. The first is the seller has no mortgage, and the other one is the seller has a mortgage. This is going to just change a couple of things. Other than that, it doesn't matter. Don't think that it's going to change your numbers, change how you structure the deal. The numbers are the numbers and the numbers don't lie. So you have to make the numbers work. And I'm going to show you how to do that. Subject to existing financing. Every HUD-1 settlement statement line 203 has this. So what it's saying is if you can't assume the loan without qualifying, you can still assume the mortgage subject to this will allow the investor to take ownership without notifying the bank. We're not calling the bank saying, the seller really wants to give me the deed, but we're going to keep the loan in place. Now, I'm going to tell you some cons on this too. So let me get there. Next is what we call a wrap or a wraparound mortgage. And I want you to think of this as secondary finance. Like there's a first lien in place, right? Now we're creating a second one that literally wraps around the first one. As a quick example, if the seller has an existing loan balance of 300, doesn't mean it's worth 300, it could be worth four or 500. They have a balance of 300. The seller can create a wraparound for more than that 300. So 350, 400, 500, whatever that property is worth and whatever they're willing to sell it for. So we're taking, keeping the existing loan in place and then wrapping it. Okay, now if that has totally confused everyone, I'm going to simplify it even more for you. But when you do this, I want you to make sure, obviously you need to verify. I try to verify mortgage info, like pretty much almost every deal. Okay, but this is really important because obviously you don't want the seller to sell it to you less than what they owe. All right, so let me simplify these two differences. In a wraparound, 
to provide a separate loan to those who cannot qualify. I don't care if you qualify or not, just doing the strategy makes more sense. How is it paid? The buyer pays the seller. Whereas in a subject to what you're doing is paying the remaining amount owed. We would see this as more common working pre foreclosures where I'm just going to take over whatever existing debt is on the property. I'm going to take that subject to, and then I pay the lender. I'm not going to allow the seller to make that payment for me. In a wraparound, generally speaking, this is actually really good for sellers because they can create a second lien, let's just call it that, which is the wraparound. And then the buyer then makes the payment set on the terms of that wraparound. And then of course, there's already an existing loan in place that the owner and the bank have agreed to, which they've paid. Okay, so this is really trying to simplify what these two differences are. Subject to is not a strategy. Wraparound is not a strategy. The strategy is seller financing. If the owner deeds you the home, there's a due on sale clause. So 1982 is when this went into effect. So all current mortgages have a due on sale clause, which means the lender could call the loan due if the deed is transferred to another party. This is extremely rare. And I can honestly tell you, I've never personally seen a lender do it. I've had numerous attorneys that I've worked with over the years. They haven't seen a bank call the loan due when the payments are current. Now, think about this. If you're in pre-foreclosure, they are calling the loan due. That's what the foreclosure process is. But if payments are being made, this is extremely rare. I want you to think about this. If Bo deeds me the house, mm -hmm. do you think the bank is going, ah, you know what? There's something going on here. Bo owns the house, but I keep getting this check from Mr. Goff. We better investigate this. No, what do they do? They process the payments. That's what they do. They don't want to foreclose. Every dollar a bank has to take back from a foreclosure is $3 just lending, general lending, car loans, other mortgages. So this is a huge liability because banks have to be what's called passive. They make money by loaning money, not taking liabilities in. All right, so why in the world would a seller agree to this, right? Well, maybe they don't need cash up front. I can tell you, this is, this is a good tip. And I, I've asked this question numerous times. When the seller says, no, 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 I need all cash. I said, well, you owe oh, about this. That only leaves you about 50 or 60,000. What do you plan on doing with that money? And a lot of times they have no idea. So unless they're going to reinvest it or something, a lot of people have no idea. I'm like, well, let's just keep it in place because you're going to make more interest off of doing this deal than actually reinvesting it in the stock market or a rental that doesn't do well, something of that nature. So a lot of times they don't need cash. Maybe they can't sell. You know, this is like the perfect time right now. The buyer pool is going down because interest rates are up. So now you have people going, I don't know, maybe I should rent. You know, that $300,000 house they could afford last year, they can't afford this year. Maybe you can only get a $250,000 house. This is a perfect opportunity that we are literally walking into. Don't listen to all the negativity that, that you hear out there. Usually people don't get into real estate until it's all over the news. Then it's too late. You talk to any multi-millionaire today, and I guarantee you they're buying up property right now. That's your sign, not the media. Obviously, prevent foreclosure. This is the strategy we're going to use, like I said before. How many sellers cannot even afford to fix it up? I can tell you, Bo and I bought a property from a landlord. Every year, he had to keep lowering his rent because he couldn't afford to put money into the property. Eventually, it became so bad that the quality of tenant went down. And then there was a, like, was there a gun shooting or something, Bo? I don't know, but I know the cops and the firefighters. They found a gun somewhere. Buying that property. I think some drug deals were even going on in that one. Oh, I, what was it? The fire department or police department was like, thank you for buying that. <laughs> uh, I think but that's the both. point. <laughs> If you can't afford to fix up the property, it's just going to keep depreciating the value. It's, it's not a good sign. 
think about just an absentee owner, somebody that owns the property, but doesn't live there. Maybe they're just getting tired of it. Maybe they don't want to be a landlord. They could get a better return than if they put it in most mutual funds and just general stock market stuff. And of course, there are tons of other reasons behind this. The one thing that you cannot do in this business, only because I hear this a lot, is quit trying to put yourself inside the seller's head saying, well, I wouldn't do that. You're not them. You're not going through. I always say real estate deals evolve from situations. Somebody is going through something in their lives that is forcing them to do something with this property. You do not necessarily have to be motivated to want to do this deal, which I'm going to show you how to structure these deals to where it makes sense. The very first thing we have to do is we have to go find the deal. I always say spend 90% of your time finding deals, period. Hands down, this is the number one thing you need to do. Obviously, you can jump into REI Pro, which I'm going to jump into. We're going to actually pull live deals, current for sale by owners, listings, and rentals. What I love about the rentals is that the owner is already willing to accept a monthly payment. Now it's just a matter if they just want to sell it. Expired listings, local Facebook groups. That's how we found the property that I personally live in. And of course, pre-foreclosures, which we can also look up in REI Pro. I'm going to go through an example. Like I said, it's an example. The one thing that I love about this strategy is you can change the numbers so many ways. Now, obviously, we need to get all the facts. And when we run an example, even though I, I'll do it in a specific order, some of these things actually happen at the same time, which I'm going to explain. So found this property. They're asking $299. The ARV is $325. As you can see, there's not much equity in this property. The rent value is $2,700. And it needs roughly about 15000 in repairs, some updates. Just, I call it lipstick stuff. And the reason is job loss. Okay, so I want you to put yourself in their shoes, not in their head, but in their shoes right now. You just lost your job. Some people can go out and get another job very quickly, and some can't. What can the seller do? I want to ask yourself that question. What can the seller do right now? They could sell it themselves, right, for sale by owner. They could list the home with an agent. They could rent the home. They could dip into their savings account until they get another job, or it could potentially go into foreclosure. I want you to think of this because this is a good tip when we start structuring these deals. If you list a home and have to pay out a 6% commission, even if it's worth 325, it needs lipstick. The buyer's going to come down on price, and then there's a commission paid. What, and then there's closing. So what does the actual seller end up with? It's not like a year and a half, two years ago, where like there's multiple offers, you couldn't even find a property. I'm telling you, this is a different time. And it happened with just the snap of the finger here. Now, what you need to do, number one, this is what you need to do is what you hear it all the time, qualify the seller. Basically what we're doing here is determining their situation. What is the situation? The situation is loss of job. Then we need to visit the home. We need to determine repair costs. And something not talked about a lot is building that relationship. That is huge. Huge. Yeah, I don't think you would have gotten the uh, six-month reprieve on your payment without building that relationship. No, you know, that started with our very first phone call. And Bo, you were actually there mm -hmm. when I made the call. Yep. And that started building the relationship right there. And that continued until I saw the property, which he wasn't even here when I looked at the property. He had a someone local, to, you know, just kind of taking care of the home, opened the door up, built a relationship with him. And when I talk about building relationships, the one thing that I always say is stay in control. The one way you could stay in control in any conversation is keep asking questions. When the seller starts asking you those questions and you can't talk, they're in control and you're not building that trust piece. Keep asking questions. I could, there was one property, I, I walked to the front door. I literally stood at the front door for five minutes talking to the seller. If you can relate to anything that a vehicle they're driving, where they're moving to, if you've been there before, if there's uh, maybe a furniture piece, I want you to talk about everything but the house, okay? The questions you ask are, how old is this? What is this? What do you think is in repairs? 
blah, blah, blah. The rest of it is really what I'm talking about is building the relationship. You can't build a relationship with the house. You build it with the owner. So ask those questions. And then, of course, we're going to structure the offer. We're just going to do all this, which is pretty cool. All right, so structuring the offer. I always say this. If the seller picks the price, you pick the terms. If the seller picks the terms, you pick the price. If the seller picks the terms and the price, they're just not motivated. Follow up with them in 30 days because there's only one thing that will change their mind, and that's time. People's circumstances change in time. Hey, Chris, yesterday I wasn't in divorce, but today I am, All right? So that situation has changed. All right, so here's the offer we are going to present to the seller, okay? So they're asking $299, but I'm going to offer $275. I'm going to offer 5000 down, 4% interest rate. Now, the sales price and the interest rate determine the monthly payment. We're going to need a mortgage calculator, which I'm going to show you how to do this. Now, how many properties can you get in with 5000 down? You don't know until you ask. Uh, I think America is the only place that you never really ask for a discount. But if you go to any other country, you always barter. You have to ask for what's going to make sense for you. I'm going to justify where this owner is going to make more money here in just a second. And that's the beauty of seller financing. Taxes and insurance, you can see the total amount there per month. So my total monthly payment, $1,703. And I want to do this for five years, not 30 years. I'm going to amortize it over 30 years. Um, I'm going to show you how to do it. But I'm going to set what we call balloon payment at five years. So whatever balance is owed. I need to refinance. I need to cash the seller out, sell the property or refinance it. No maintenance cost or repairs for five years. They are literally going to get a check from me every single month. Principal payments are going to be $128902 times 60 months. That's five years. Total interest, $51,000. Total paid to the sellers, $326. So you may be saying, yeah, you offered 275, but I ended up paying 326 for it. When you show the seller how these numbers actually unfold, it makes sense. Doesn't mean they'll take your offer, right? Maybe they want to negotiate. But think about this for a second. If they say, Chris, I'm not letting you in this house for five grand down, what would you take? Right? Ask them, what is the least amount you would take? Because I need to put some money into the property. I know there's some repairs that need to be done. I don't necessarily want to make a double down payment, give you a bunch of money down, then have to turn around and put a bunch of money into the property. But if they demand a higher down payment, what if I lower the price? Or if they demand a higher down payment, maybe I go 10 years instead of five years. At the end of the day, if the numbers work, and I'm going to show you how to analyze all this stuff in best calculator on the planet that can analyze multiple situations in REI Pro, which I'm going to show you. But make the numbers work for you. You don't have to be greedy. Why am I being greedy with this offer? They're going to make $326,000 off of this, right? Now, you also have to think about your exit strategy before you even make the offer. If I bought this property, what am I going to do with it? Could you wholesale this property? Absolutely. I could set the terms of a seller finance with the owner and then assign that agreement to an investor. How many investors out there would love you for this? They don't have to go to the bank. The down payment's going to be a lot less and it doesn't go on their credit report. It's like, duh, this makes total sense. Could I fix the property up and sell it? Yes. Could I? use it as a rental? Could I lease option it? Could I sell or finance it? Could I move into it? Like the property, my property I showed you. When you sell or finance a property, you're getting the deed, which means you own the house. And I don't care what bank, if it's Bank of America, or if it's Chris Goff Bank, I don't care what bank it is. You have the deed, which opens up every possible exit strategy. Now our job is to analyze what exit strategy are we going to do. In this example, I'm actually going to sell or finance it back out. And I'm going to show you how to do that. All right. So one of the great things with seller financing, there's actually four profit centers. See, if you wholesale a deal, you get paid one time and then you're unemployed. 
If you fix up a house and resell it, you get paid one time and you're unemployed. If you rent it, you'll have passive income. Most rentals don't even make enough money to pay my light bill. You'd have to have tons of rentals, but you're looking for the long term. This strategy, you have four profit centers. The difference in down, the difference in monthly, the sales price, and then my favorite is what I call a discount. So let me show you exactly what I mean. This is the offer to the seller, and it's going to be where our first profit is going to be. I'm going to structure the terms with the new buyer. I can change this however I see fit as long as it's more than what I'm paying the seller. Would you agree? Yes. Right? We obviously need to make money. Now, this buyer, maybe they are qualified, but they go this route because I might be able to offer a lower interest rate than a current bank. Or maybe they're not qualified. And that's the reason why. So you're opening up the entire buyer pool, just offering this out there. I'm going to ask for 20 down. Could I ask for more? Probably. What happens if you get a buyer who says, Chris, I don't have 20,000. Well, how much do you have? That's my first response. I've got 15. Well, when could you come up with the other five? But we have to make sure the numbers work. I'm going to charge interest rate. You can play with this. What I like to do is set the price, set the interest rates. I'm going to try to figure out where that cash flow needs to be for me. In this example, like I said, it's just an example. Okay. That monthly payment comes out to $18.58. So here I'm paying the seller that $12.89. They're going to pay me this. Now, this is your first profit center. Soon as I bring the buyer in, they're giving me 20. I gave the seller five, right? So that's 15 grand. Second profit center is going to be monthly income. So each month they're paying me and I'm either paying the seller or paying the bank, depending if I did a subject to or wraparound, okay? The third profit center is going to be the difference in sales price, but you have to amortize this. So I did this for you, but I'm going to show you an REI Pro how to do it as well. So the down payment, you could see first three profit centers made 15000 Monthly, $500, almost $70 a month. But keep in mind, I'm going to go back. I set the term with the new buyer for three years, but I have a term of five years with the seller. Now. A lot of people get confused. They think they have to go all the way to the five years or all the way to three years. No, I could sell or finance a house today for five-year balloon and cash them out tomorrow. There is no prepayment penalty or anything like that. So when the buyer gets financing, and here's the cool part, when you sell or finance this to a buyer, it's not a new loan. It's a refi which is a lot easier to get qualified for. Now, of course, the, the price has to, whatever they owe me at the end of three years, it's got to be worth it, right? So you're going to have to have an appraisal done. So that $570 per month positive cash flow, I sell or finance it from the owner, sell or finance it to a new buyer. So the taxes, insurance, that cost carries over. Nobody, it's all break even. So I'm not even including that in an example here. I have no maintenance cost or repairs on this 569. Multiply that by 36 months because if the buyer went to the end of the term of three years, it's a lot of money. I'm going to amortize both loans. So remember with the seller, I'm buying it at two, let me go back, 275 minus the five, that's 270. I have to amortize that to see where my balance is for three years because my buyer is going to cash me out at three years. The buyer, I'm doing the same thing. 330 minus the 20, they have a $310,000 loan. That difference, which I've already calculated for you, is 42,000. That's a $78,000 profit. Yes, that happened over three years. But how many tenant problems did I have? None. How much maintenance costs and repairs? None. How much turnover did I have? None. If they stop paying me, I'll just take the property back and do this all over again. But let me show you the fourth profit center. I've done this so many times and I'm going to do it like I do it with the seller just for you, but I'm going to put the words up here for you too. So I want you to keep in mind, what do we have with the seller? Remember the buyer's cashing us out in three years. So three years have gone, but we have a five-year term with the owner, the original seller. 
So our balance after three years with the seller is 255. When that buyer is ready to cash me out, I have to cash the seller out. The deal is then cashed out. At that moment of time, this is what I want you to say to the seller. Hey, Mr. Or Miss Seller, I know I currently owe you about 255, but I just ran into a bunch of money, like a lot of money. Now, if I could pay you 245 today, would you accept that? Or do you want to wait another two years for your money? What would you do? I could tell you how many people was like, yeah, we'll do it today. If you did, that would just make you another 10 grand. Now, if they said, no, Chris, <laughs> I want all my money. The buyer's still closing with me and I still have to cash the seller out. But like I said before, don't be scared to ask for a discount. If they did that, of course, they'd make another 10 grand. Now, the only things I'm not taking in consideration, only because I want, if you're just getting started, I want you to understand the concept and some of the numbers. We're going to go back through the numbers in REI Pro. Could there be holding costs? Did I put the 15 in the property or did I not? The closing cost, there's going to be other costs associated with that. But even if you took that into consideration, you're still making a lot of money. Also think about this for a second. If I didn't put repairs in, I could have sold it probably for a little bit less than the 330 to the buyer, right? But let's assume that I didn't for a second. How much money did it really cost me to do this deal? I had to put five grand down. Generally, I'll have my attorney draft up the contract. So that's another 500 to 1,000, could be three grand wherever you live. I literally have less than 10 grand invested into this property. And I have a potential to make 88,000. It's not on my credit report. But this is a home run. This is why, especially this year, 2023, this is all going to move into next year as well. I want you to just imagine here, if you just did one deal, right? One deal is great. But here's what I always tell my students. If you could do one deal, you could do 10 deals. If you just did 10 of these identical deals, I get it, Chris. You know, hey, you're crazy. Not every deal is the same. Yeah, yeah, I got it, right? Some you make less, some you make more. Just depends on how the numbers work. But if you did 10, just multiply everything by 10. So 150,000 in down payment money. Cash flow is fi almost 5,700 a month times three years, we're looking at 205 grand. And then we're looking at the balances of these 427, I mean, 577,000. You just need 10. It's not like you have to go work a million hours. You just need to know what you're doing. And that's why it was so important to put this presentation together for those that are getting started. Or maybe you're a wholesale and you're like, man, I keep hearing about this. I've seen some videos on this. I really want to dive in. But I'm not sure what to do here. Hopefully this is helping out. So obviously the offer gets accepted. The very first thing that I do, and I recommend to everybody, especially now, you get an attorney to draw up the contracts. Obviously, if you have an attorney that does closings, I prefer to do the closings there personally, because they kind of understand what you're doing. This is not, I would say, a typical normal close that would happen at a title company, but title companies will do it too. Now your exit strategy obviously will determine what your next steps are. Are you rehabbing it? Are you not? Are you, what are you doing with the property? And then of course, I want you to repeat this process. All right. So I'm in REI Pro. This is our lead generation section. Obviously, if you're an REI Pro member, you know this. So I'm going to click this in the menu here, lead pro. Now I'm going to pick a place. I'm going to pick a county. You can pick a zip code. You can pick a small town, city, whatever you want. If you are just getting started, now we have tons of lead sources here. Absentee, owner free and clear, high, low equity, owner occupied, pre-foreclosures, trusts, upside down properties, meaning they're upside down on their mortgage, vacant properties, bank owned, potential investors, and then vacant land. But if you don't know what you're looking for, we have this really cool button here called search by strategy. When you click that, it's going to pull up the strategies. I'm going to click seller financing and hit search. Now, once this pulls up, as you can see, we have 7,100, over 7,100 leads. Now, we have some predefined filters here. If I go over to my filter button, 
the very first thing is the lead type. So I like to, if I were to say, hey, Chris, tell me what is the number one lead type for seller financing? I would say absentee owners, pre-foreclosures, vacant properties potentially. Now I could actually select vacant and absentee. And this is what we call list stacking. I could say also in pre-foreclosure as well. I want to stick with just the absentee owners for a second. So this is an owner that owns a property but doesn't live here. Now we have selected townhouse, condo, multifamily, mobile, any piece of real estate that is recorded in the U.S., you'll be able to find in here. And if it's not under one of these major categories, you could go into this search box. So you could actually pull, you can pull a dairy farm, a bowling alley, all kinds of things. I'm going to stick with single family in this area only because I know there's more of it. As I scroll down, the estimated value of these properties, I like to say this is the middle of the road seller. You could go a little bit under in value and a little bit over in value. So what we do for you is we actually calculate the median price point for the county. And then I go 100 less, 100 more. Now, feel free. You can go in and change this. Okay, it doesn't have to be those exact numbers. Again, remember, I'm just talking about the most perfect seller situation. Potential equity, I put it 100%, meaning they own the property free and clear. We can structure so many seller finance deals with little equity. But if you ask me what is the best one, it would be 100% equity because it's going to be so much easier to do this deal. I'm going to exclude any HELOCs, and of course, especially being in Florida, reverse mortgages, okay? Now, maybe you're picky and you want to pick certain, maybe I want a three, two, because maybe you want to rehab this. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. You could go by square footage, lot size. A lot of people go to the sold date, like, hey, they've owned it for more than X period of time. I'm just telling you, I don't really buy into any of that because I know that people sell because there's a situation going on. It's not like, I don't know. Yeah, maybe today's a good day to sell because you sent me a postcard. Yeah, why not? Most people that sell want to sell or there's a reason that's forcing them to sell, okay? So I want you to understand that people sell based on situations. Situations change every single day. And I feel that you will limit the opportunities if you go in and select more than two years or five years, especially this business. As far as the owners, I'm going to go individual own. I'm going to just stay away from the company owned. It's very difficult to talk to the person that can actually make a decision. That's the problem. Where an individual owned, I'm more likely to actually talk to that person. Then because it's, I want you to remember this, because it's absentee, they don't live there. Look at the bottom right here. Do they live in state or out of state? Now, some people feel that if, okay, this property is in Florida. If the owner lives out of state, they're probably more motivated. Well, no, motivation only comes from a situation. You could live down the street and go through health issues and need to sell. So I always like to just, I want as many as I could possibly can get. But if you want to maybe build two separate campaigns and kind of test it out, maybe you do a campaign that says, okay, let me just do the in-state versus the out-of-state. Feel free to do that. I could then apply those filters and that's going to obviously lower our number here. So now we're at 995. I want to show you something. If you need to fine tune this list, like maybe you... You like to start with Broward County, but eh, maybe you just don't vest. I'm just zooming in, okay? That's all I'm doing. You could zoom all the way to the street level and see all this stuff. One of the really cool parts, especially if you're a rehabber, where you may rehab properties in like very specific neighborhoods. If you just hover over this satellite, click over here. We're going to click neighborhoods. We're actually going to list the neighborhoods for you. Now, if you don't want to see all the neighborhoods, of course, you can click that off. Another thing is maybe you want to check the high school boundary lines because, you know, this is a C minus rating. Now, technically, I could just click this and add all the properties that meet my filter criteria 
only in that one school system. You have that ability. You also, let me, I'm just going to get rid of that. You can go middle school, elementary as well, but most, most people, they'll go high school level. You can also just start drawing on here. Now, that's obviously not really fine-tuned here, but you get the point. And you can see how many leads are going to fall within these actual shapes. Now, if I keep scrolling, I want to show you another thing. And this is getting pretty picky, but hey, investors, you know, it, it's up to you where you like to invest. Now, as I scroll in here, of course, you can see the purple dots. These are the properties that meet our filter criteria. Now, I could just go in and really kind of fine tune this drawing here to very specific pieces. Now, you could do this up to eight times. It's another opportunity for you to really gather leads. Now, one last thing before I move this to a marketing campaign. I'm going to scroll back. Now, we started with Broward County. One other thing that I want to show you, let's see, is what we call search by map. This is really, really important, especially if you're on this particular side of Florida. So Broward County, we see the boundary line. I can now search my filter criteria outside that boundary line to maybe pick up some more properties because we usually just don't invest on a boundary line per se. A school boundary you might, a neighborhood boundary you might, but I know that I can invest in multiple different areas. So you do have that ability to do it. Of course, you could make this full screen as well. Now, let's just kind of go back to where we were here, 995 leads. What we need to do is we need to market these properties. I'm going to go up to my action button. And in this case, I'm going to select all leads. You could select a certain number of the 995, as well as if you order postcards through us, you could just put it in your budget. We'll calculate exactly how many postcards you can mail. So if we go there, I'm going to select all. Now you can add this to a marketing campaign. You could save all these properties to your save property section, or you can export this list. I'm going to add this to a marketing campaign and I'm going to call it Broward. And I know that I'm going for seller finance and I like to always put in, whoops, sorry. I like to always put, did it again, put in the equity percentage when I do this. Now, this is just the name. This is just for you. I could go in and select seller finance. If you already have an existing campaign, you could actually add this to an existing, but we're just going to create a new list. I'm going to add those selected leads. Now, once I do this, I'm going to go over to my main menu and I'm going to select marketing. Now, this top left here, this Broward SF, that's the campaigns that I just built. You have the ability to order postcards. You can print letters. You can also do bulk skip tracing. In this example, I'm going to order postcards. I always have like, if you have a large number of mailers to do or leads to market, I always say, you know, do postcards. It's one of the most cost-effective ways that you can market. Now you can go and do a single mailer, two mailer, three mailer. When you do a multiple type of mailer, you could set the frequency. You could select a print date. I'm going to go over and continue because there's something I want to show. So we have over 90 templates so in this particular example, I like to use this particular card. Now we have tons of other postcards. You can even upload your own custom postcard. If this is the one that I'd like. We try to cater the language towards the strategy that you're approaching because really it's obviously you got to have that wow factor. The one thing I like about postcards that hits you at the mailbox. Where do most people sort their mail? Over the trash, right? But at least with a postcard, they're going to at least look at it real quick, especially if it pops. But it's really the content on there that's really going to make it a, a winner for you. Now, if I hit continue, I'm not going to go through this whole process, but you could go in and add your contact information. So if you have phone number or website or email, whatever, however you want the seller to contact you, you could add that. You could put a return address. We can mail a copy to you as well. Okay. What is the goal? We're marketing people. We have to get the message out there. Otherwise, nobody's going to know what you do. This is just one way to market. But when I have 995 leads, I generally will do a postcard. 
Could I then send a follow-up? Maybe it's a letter, or maybe I do a skip trace as a follow-up. Any of those combinations is going to work well. Some people need to be contacted more than one time. I see a lot of people, they'll, they'll put, send 50 cards out and they'll sit back and wait, see if they get a response, right? Like you, you got you got to hit them at the right time. And the more you can send, the more likely you're going to run into that moment of time. Now, let's say the seller called us back. Now, I want to actually go to my property section. I'm going to pull a property up here. The good news is I've already ran the numbers just to speed the process up. Now, for those of you, this is what we call the executable step system. It's the physical things you have to do in a specific order to close the deal. So we're going to help walk you through this process, especially if you're just getting started. This is huge. What holds us back is not knowing what to do next. I know. This is what I've been teaching. We've already contacted the owner. Send a postcard. But now, one really cool thing. You can do an individual skip trace here. Now, we have two types of skip tracing. We have just kind of a standard basic, and then we have a premium skip trace. I can pull all the nearest relatives. I can pull their cell phones, their emails, all that good stuff if they've been deceased. Obviously, if they're deceased, I would want to talk to next of kin and so forth. But one of the things, especially if you're just getting started, because if you've never done a seller finance deal before, I, I say you're a beginner at seller finance, even if you've done 50 wholesale deals, we have all the phone scripts here for you. You could obviously put in your own custom scripts as well. A lot of things that you could do, but let's get to running the numbers. Very first thing that I have to do is run comparable sales, right? So what has a property sold for that is comparable. That is so important. Now, I've already done it. And that's where I came up with my after repaired value of 325. I'll give you one pointer here. The number one column that you have to look at is square foot. Real estate is measured by cost per square foot sold. It's trying to find the average of something. Because you know, wherever you live, if you live in a single family home, Every house on that street is just a little bit different in size. So you try to come, and I'm not talking about this has an in-ground pool and that has granite countertops. Those are the amenities. And of course, that's going to increase the value. On that same street, we're trying to find that happy middle to determine what something could sell for. But that's the number one column. Of course, the other columns are just as important, but the number one thing that I want to look for. Now, I'm going to go in and select one thing I do want to note. Florida is not what we call a non-disclosure state, such as like Texas. So if you go to Texas and you go to Zillow, they can't publicly show you what a property is sold for on a public website. Because this is a login, we have access to all 50 states to the MLS. You're going to get the best of both worlds. So you can see like this first comp C. Well, let's go up to the top. This first comp A you see this little go-to button. I always like to go and verify pictures, like really what was the condition of that property when it sold? Okay, but this was not an MLS sale. So that means it didn't come from the MLS. So you do have for sale by owners or you have sellers selling properties without using an agent. But you can also see the little MLS tag there as well. So you can see which ones. Now, of course, if you're in a non-disclosure state such as Texas, they all say MLS because that's where we're going to get it from. Now, once I do this and run comps, and you could filter these comps, there's a lot of really awesome filters in here. I'm going to go to my seller finance offer. Now, keep in mind, you could do a cash offer. You could do a lease option offer. You could do a seller finance. If you're working pre-foreclosures, you could work and determine a pre-foreclosure offer here as well. But this is what we're talking about is seller financing. So I've carried my ARV over. I've set my price. I set my down payment. I set my interest rate. Remember, we're going to amortize it for over 30 years. We're going to do a five-year balloon. We carry the taxes over, and then I put in the estimated insurance, which gives us this summary breakdown to your right. This is a huge sales pitch to the seller. Although I'm offering 275, they're going to get totally get paid 326. Remember, no maintenance costs, all that stuff that comes along with, you know, like a rental would. I can pull the amortization schedule. There's a button here. And I can see my balance every single month up to the five-year mark. At the end of five years, that's where, if you remember in the PowerPoint, my balance 
was that number there. Okay. But remember, we're seller financing it back out. So I need to understand my exit strategy. So if you go over to Deal Pro, I've already saved one analysis here, which is a seller finance, seller finance. You can plug in exactly how you're acquiring the property, how you're getting rid of the property, which is seller finance, and it's going to calculate your cash on cash, your return, and your cash profit on this. You could do this in multiple ways. You remember what I talked about? If you have the deed, you have so many exit strategies, right? What happens if I want to sell, flip it? Or maybe I want to just rent the property out. Could you not do this? And, and, and when I tell you this, you're going to think of so many other ways to do this. Could you sell or finance it from the owner? You have five years, rent it out for four years, and then do a lease option the last year. Absolutely. There's so many ways that you can analyze these deals. And that's going to tell you which direction you want to go as far as your exit strategy. So we're taking all that guesswork out of it for you and saying, no, 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 here's what it would be in all of these different situations. Okay, so that's how I'm going to analyze all of these numbers. Now, we talked about putting it under contract. When we do seller financing, we do have some example seller finance agreements here. Okay, and this is for example purposes because I absolutely, you're going to need an attorney to draft all this up. Now, if I need to quickly put a seller finance under contract, I could use our contract to purchase, oh, sorry, with addendum, this third one right here. In the addendum, I'm going to specify the terms of the actual agreement. Just to, If I need to get this thing under contract tomorrow, this is what I can do to quickly get it under contract. And then I could have the attorney draft it all up. Like if I'm late on payments, you know, what could happen, this, that, and so forth. Okay, so it's more official. It's going to be a lot longer document. Our contract to purchase with addendum total is two pages. And this is going to get you locked in because if you don't put this under contract right away, could the seller sell it to somebody else? Absolutely. And that's why we have what's called step six, which is protecting the deal. And then we get into buyers, contracts for the buyers closing the deal, and then, of course, payday. So we're going to walk you through this whole process. The great thing is, is that this strategy you should be doing. This is going to be a home run strategy for you this year, next year, and the year after, in the next 20 years. But especially now, I want you to think about it. Remember, I offered the seller a lower interest rate than I could get qualified for today at the bank. And you could ask yourself all day long, why would they take such a low interest rate? They're not really making 4 or 5% because I put a balloon on it. You remember when we go back here to the seller finance offer, they're making an extra $51,000 total interest paid for the five years. Now, of course, if I seller finance it to a buyer for three years, it's going to be a little bit less. But if we went the whole five years, they're making an extra 51000 just for saying yes. That amount of interest is way larger than the 4% interest rate that I put in here. And that's why I say to the sellers, what are you going to do with the cash if you sold the property? Because most people don't own their house free and clear. Well, why don't you just keep it here and make money on it? It just makes sense.